Good afternoon. This is Aaron Wiesner from Local Future. It is May the 20th, 2020, and I'm on a call live with Robert Rapier from New Mexico. Uh, Phoenix. I'm in Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona. It's very interesting that you say Phoenix because um, I was talking with someone or watching a video or something about Phoenix. Maybe, maybe it was you that had posted something about how um, the amount of energy required per person who lives in Phoenix to have all the, the stuff of civilization, electricity and water and all those things. I mean, it takes a lot of energy to be able to live there as far right. as civilization energy. Whereas in Michigan, you know, we have rain and we have grass and we, we have that stuff taken care of. So- Yeah, I the first time I ever flew into here, I was struck by all the golf courses. And I thought, wow, boy, they, they must use an incredible amount of water here. And, you know, if I was just picking a place to live, I, I wouldn't pick here. I mean, for sustainability, it's, uh, it's tough. And it's, you know, I like to garden and it's really tough to garden here because the temperature goes from mild to a hundred degrees over the course of a month. And like tomatoes, I've grown tomatoes everywhere I've been, but here, you know, when the tomatoes start to uh, bud, they start to blossom, you get 100 degree temperatures rapidly. And so you really can't get any regular tomato formation here. Maybe if you were shaded most of the day, um, but you know, that the sun right now, I've got okra that gets sun all day long and I've got okra that gets sun half the day. The okra that's in the sun half the day is twice as high as the as what gets sun all day. And they both get enough water. So uh, yeah, that, all day, you know, 100, 110 degrees and the sun is uh, not good. Hey, can you tilt your um, screen toward you just a tad? Yeah, that's better. Awesome. Okay, okay so let's, um, we were on a call a month ago today and it was the end of the April oil futures contract and it had went negative. Right. So I'm very curious, what have you learned since then about oil and oil futures and the economy? Yeah, so it's funny because I told somebody today, you know, oil prices are about $60 higher than they were a month ago. And they said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, they were negative $30 this time last month and they're $33 as the June contract expires today. So, um, you know, I think what happened a month ago was a lot of absolute sheer panic selling, especially once prices went negative. You had a lot of people who, I mean, I, I saw interviews with people who said they had no idea that could happen. So, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote about that afterwards. And I said, if you're a speculator and you tried to buy oil at $10 a barrel, and then at the end of the day, it's negative $37 a barrel. I mean, you went from not just 100% loss. You went from losing way more money than you put up. So, um, Right, because you have to, on futures, you have to put in about, what, 10% or 20%? Yeah, I mean, you, you well, you're buying, so you're buying a thousand barrels for, right. so uh, imagine that you spent $10,000 and you're buying, you know, a thousand barrel oil futures. So you spent $10,000. By the end of the day, you owed $37,000. I mean, you, you didn't just wipe out, you owed $37,000 at the end of the day. So I think that's probably enough to shake a lot of the speculators out. So I expected that uh, as we came to the close of the June contract, we'd see a similar dynamic. We'd see, you know, people dumping oil and the prices down. We've seen the opposite. And the reason we've seen the opposite is the same reason the stock market's going up right now is the markets are forward looking and they believe that things are improving enough that, uh, you know, there's a lot of psychology here. And if you look at the fundamentals of the oil market today, right now, and the fundamentals of the stock market, they don't justify the prices that we're seeing. But if you believe that, you know, we're coming to the end of this pandemic and things are going to get better and better, you know, a lot of places are still forecasting a strong third quarter bounce and uh, recovery from this. And so if you believe that, and the markets are saying, you know, plenty of people do believe it, then it's understandable why a lot of people are piling back into the market and, and oil prices are going up. Um, meanwhile, our production in the U.S., we were at 13 million barrels a day uh, a couple of months ago. We're now at 11 and a half. So we've come down more than 10 percent. Um, 
that's happened all over the world. People are shutting in production. So we had a huge, huge supply imbalance a month ago and storage was filling up. And what's happened since then is demand has come back up. More people are out on the roads now. Uh, places are starting to open back up. So demand is going up some and supply has gone down and storage has sort of stabilized. So it no longer looks, you know, people aren't panic dumping oil because there's no storage. It looks like the market is a little bit more balanced than what it was. So that's what's got oil prices back up to $33. And- um, well, it Sounds like an overshoot situation last month. Uh, yes, it, was, it definitely was panic selling. I mean, I didn't expect that we'd see that again, that sort of, you know, negative $30 or $40 because people realize then, oh, that could happen. I'm going to watch out and be careful and make sure that uh, I don't get caught in that situation again. I mean, certainly when you have a market, literally there's unlimited downside. Uh, that will shake a lot of speculators out of the market. I mean, typically you buy a stock and you can't lose more than the money you put up if it goes bankrupt. But here, you know, what we learned is you can lose a lot more money. And I saw seasoned traders who said, I did not know this was possible. Um, you know, literally, and I wrote an article about it, you know, the market with unlimited downside, you know, put up a dollar and lose $10,000. It's, it's not likely, but it's possible. You can lose way, way more money than you put up. Well, this reminds me, uh, I don't know if I told you this story, but in 2007, I got into an oil futures contract, just one contract, right? And the price was when I bought it 137 or something. And I was pretty sure this was right before the ASPO conference, the ASPO conference in Denver, I think. Yep. And I was, I was like, you know, oil is so valuable. If, if you imagine a gallon of gasoline and it can take your, your car and your five buddies 40 miles, and then you run out of gas and you push the car home and it takes, 20 hours times four guys, five guys, and how much you'd have to pay them, you know, 40 hours, say $20 an hour, $800 or something like that, like $1,000. The oil, I mean, it's so valuable. And so I was sure that it's got to go up because, I mean, it's going up and up. And I was like, oh, the supply is going down and stuff. But then I got, I stayed in and I stayed in and it went down to 120, 130 and then 125. And I kept on getting these phone calls from um, Lind Waldock or whatever they are now. And they said, you know, we need more money. We need more money. I kept putting thousands in and thousands. And I'm like, well, it's going to go back up. It's going to go back up. Yep. But when people get in these contracts, if they get in like that, you know, you don't put in a hundred percent. You don't buy like the whole thing. You buy a small bit of it. Right. And then the person on the other side, there's somebody on the other side of the trade who is betting against you basically. And they put in the right. same amount. So if it goes up, you get their money. If it goes down, they get your money. Right. But, but I can just imagine last month. So there's people who bought at $10 on a day, that day. There were people on the other side of that, right? So they're right. the people that made all that money all the way down to the $40, $40 or something. So they, right. they put right. in, you know, they put in maybe at, at $10, let's say they put in $3 they put in $3 of that or $2 of that and they made like 40. Yeah, no, people made huge, huge fortunes on that day as well. I mean, we know people lost a lot of money, but- uh, And the it, money just went from here to there. Right, some of that's luck. I mean, you, you can't ever predict that oil is going to negative $40. You can look and you can say, you know, oil market is really tight right now on, on uh, storage and we're gonna have a bit of a problem going into the end of the contract but you could never predict that it would go, you know, negative that much. That's like, I, I've called it the black swan within the black swan. I mean, we've got the pandemic black swan right now going on that's uh, caused a lot of volatility, but then, you know, for oil prices to go not only negative for the first time for WTI, but to go as deeply negative as it did, that was certainly a black swan. Nobody, nobody saw that coming. I've, I've never seen anybody make a prediction like that. I mean, they said, you know, we might see localized oil prices go negative, but they're talking about, you know, some guy that wants to keep his well pumping is willing to sell at a small loss so he doesn't have to close in his well. I'm not talking about going to, you know, negative $40, which is insane. You know, imagine that you bought oil at negative $40 on that day. And then the next day you, it went back up and closed above zero. Oh, you made a tremendous amount of money. 
So everybody who, yeah. So like there's half of the people, not half of the people, but half of the money that went in or something, there are some big winners and big losers. And after I, you know, I eventually got out of that contract I was in after uh, two years of my salary, that's, that's my gross salary, vanished into someone else's pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I had been warned ag ag against this investment strategy, but it was already going down. And I was yeah. like, well, I'm, I, can't, I can't get out now because I will have lost so much already. Um, yeah, I got to stay in. I, and, I always uh, warn casual investors not to play the physical oil market. That's yeah, uh, I, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah. I've never well, bought a physical contract. I mean, I, and, and I never will just because there's, if you try to value it on the energy content, you'll always come up with a much, much higher value than oil trades at. And, and sometimes there are just complete disconnects in the market. You've got high oil prices and low gasoline prices or vice versa because storage in between oil and gasoline can be tight or excess. And so it, it's really a complicated market to try to trade in. And, and you know, even, you know, some somebody last month might've gotten very lucky and some amateurs probably got very lucky. The problem with that is eventually luck runs out. And, uh, you know, if you don't really know what you're doing, if you're an amateur in that market, eventually you will take a really big loss. Well, I think people, if people understand that it is exactly the same as a casino where you're going in and you're putting the money in and your odds are almost 50-50, but not 50-50. They're like- except, except you actually can take possession of the oil. So if yeah, you're true. trading, so that's the difference in a casino. You put your money down in a casino and it's either, you know, you made money, you lost money, but at the end of the day, you put your money down here, you know, they're going to, want to know where you want your thousand barrels of oil. <laughs> Which is a liability. Yes. So, so what I was going to, what I looked into after that was, you know, still trying to get into futures, but this time limited loss with uh, option. So there's something yep. you probably know. That I remember, I knew these terms at one time, but there's like a put and a call. Calls and, and puts. You can either be on the one side or the other side. Right. And so if you want limited loss, um, if, you, if you think it's going to go up, you can have a limited loss situation where if it goes down, your loss is static. Right. And you can do right. the other way. So you, you can, can protect yourself. So, you know, I don't trade physical oil, but I trade stocks almost every day. And um, calls and puts are the same way. If you want to protect a position, you buy a put. And the put allows you to sell that stock at a given price. So, you know, if I'm sitting on, you know, ConocoPhillips and I own some shares of ConocoPhillips from the time I worked there, I've never sold them from, I never bought any, but they were given to us profit sharing over the years. And at the beginning of the year, those shares were, I don't know, about $65. Now, if I'd have bought a put, so I could bought a May put to sell those shares for $65, I would have paid some premium. And it's like insurance shares ultimately went down to like $30. But because I had that put, I can still sell them for, well, I will still sell them for 65. And whoever, whoever bought that or whoever sold me that put, they're on the hook. They have to buy them for, those, for that price. It's a, it's a really good, you know, selling and buying calls and puts are really good strategies at times. And, and they can actually be really conservative. I mean, if you have dividend stocks, you can sell covered calls against your position. So, because most people lose money ultimately in the options market, I like to be on the selling side. So I will sell uh, uh, calls against my positions. And, um, you know, if they get called away, for example, again, I've got ConocoPhillips at $65. I will sell a call saying, you can buy my shares at $70 in three months and you pay me for that, for that option. And so if, those shares get called away, I'm gonna make $5 a share, plus I get to keep the option that I sold you. So that's a good uh, conservative use of options is selling covered calls against your own positions. And like some of our viewers, I wasn't following that 100%, but I know I can rewind. Yep. <laughs> because this isn't, I mean, it's, it's not something that you can hear, at least not for me, hear one time and then be like, oh yeah. Well, and it's not a typical conversation is about energy, but I also, you know, I write a lot of uh, investment stuff and I've traded stocks for 30 years. So there are some most, I, I recommend most people don't trade options 
But if you do trade options, there are actually very conservative ways to, to use options where you are selling, you know, these covered calls against your positions. And I, I always say it, it allows me to essentially double up my dividends uh, every year. So you got a, a position that yields 4%. I can usually make another 4% on that just selling covered calls with the risk that my shares are called away, but with no downside protection. It doesn't protect me if the shares fall, except I still get to keep that premium for the call that I sold. But anyway, that's getting off into a different topic. No, that's all right. I mean, this is, I think this is interesting anyways, because people do this like a lot, right? I mean, this is something that impacts pension funds and right. 401ks and IRAs and GDPs. And I mean, this is a right. real thing that really happens a lot. And it's yeah. not just with oil, it's with all, all the commodities, right? And right. stocks as well, bonds, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't trade much, I, I, very little bonds. Uh, I've been, because I'm an aggressive investor and have a long time horizon, I've always had, I've, I've always had minimal exposure to bonds. But as I'm getting older, I, I'm, I'm shifting into like bond funds. So, you know, there's a lot less volatility there. And I always recommend if you're within five years of retirement, you really need to dial your risk down. Because, you know, we've recovered a lot of the March uh, losses but I think there's still a lot of risk in this market right now. Um, if we don't get the bounce back that, you know, some people are projecting, you know, we can revisit those lows pretty quickly. And I know people that took enormous losses to their portfolio. And so if you are in that boat and you've recovered a lot of your losses from March, I would seriously think about lightening up on your risk. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty much all in cash. So yeah. That's, right now, Every, it's probably not a bad place to be. Everything's in the credit union and, and the bank and the other credit union and the other credit union. So some, some of these energy companies are up more than 100% since March. I mean, some, some major names have had huge gains. I mean, you could have bought Chevron for really cheap in March. Uh, you could have bought a lot of master limited partnerships for really cheap in March, more than, more than double your money at this point. But the risks at the time were high because... You know, we don't know where the bottom is in the oil market, and we don't know how long this COVID crisis is going to go on. So, you know, I, I, I advise a lot of people during that time, and I said, just be aware. You, it's a really high risk, high reward scenario. And always remember, when it's high risk, high reward, don't forget the high risk part. Because, <laughs> of the, you know, people hear that and they think, well, you know, I'm going to play this because I'm playing it for the reward. But, you know, that risk, sometimes you have to pay the piper and you have to be prepared to do that. So I was talking with uh, Gail Tverberg yesterday, and I talked with Nicole Foss on Sunday, and they both have a rare, very uh, bearish, I guess you could say, right? That's down yep. view of the global economy. Yep. And I, I'm curious, since you're, you're looking at this stuff every single day all the time, do you have a view or what, yeah. what are the probabilities yeah. as far as you see and what do you see as the likely, what do you see as the range of where it could end up? You know? so, so I think about this all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a planner, I'm a long range planner and I look and I do risk assessments all the time. So I say, what, is, what are the risks here? What are the potential consequences? Um, you know, what if I'm wrong? That's, a, that's an important question people don't often ask. You know, what, I actually wrote an article for the oil drum years ago saying, you know, I, I think peak oil is a few years out, but what if I am wrong? And I went through the implications of what does it mean to be wrong here? And uh, a lot of people don't do that. They don't challenge their positions, but I'm, I'm always second guessing and questioning. And so what I, I, I watch this COVID situation all the time. This is the great variable that, uh, you know, we can't be sure. Um, we can't even be sure we're getting good data. I mean, I think there is incentive for certain governors to underreport data. There's some incentive for people to overstate the numbers. Uh, people have agendas. And so, you know, we can't even be sure we're getting good numbers, but if the day, if the numbers are being underreported and we're opening up the economy and we're not taking really uh, common sense precautions, we're not enforcing those like, you know, you must wear a mask in a grocery store. If we're not doing things like that, we're going to see I think a tug of war here, I think the summer weather will help mitigate the spread, but opening up the economy is going to help accelerate the spread. So I don't know 
whether that's going to flatten off then or we're going to have a small decline or a small uh, increase over the summer. But I worry in the fall, you know, as some colleges are trying to open back up and as, as school districts are making decision to open back up, we risk a serious resurgence. And, um, you know, I don't really see the way out here. I don't see how we, uh, you know, short of just telling people, you know, we are requiring masks in public because we know that that helps mitigate the spread. It doesn't completely- well, You know what, Robert? People require pants in public. People oh, require shirts in public. Yeah. People require shoes in stores. It's just a piece of cloth. I mean- Right. But what? you've got this mindset, and I've dealt with people like this. Somebody told me the other day, wearing a mask is living in fear. And I said, do you wear your seatbelt? <laughs> I mean, wearing a shirt living in fear? Do you, do you stop at a stop sign? Do you stop at a stop line? Do you look before you cross the road? I mean, they're just common sense um, measures to protect not only you, but other people. So, and, and some guy said, I don't need you to protect me from myself. I said, I don't care about you. I care about everybody else that you are going to potentially infect. And if you're telling me and you're spreading the message, this is living in fear and people are shooting people for, you know, requiring masks, that's insanity. And we've got to, we've got to put a stop to that. Um, you know, for, if the economy is going to open back up and stay open, we really have to have some common sense measures. I don't see this happening. I don't see us having common sense. measures. I think some states will do it. So, the number one and number three states in GDP are, uh, are California and New York. They will probably be prone to, if they start to open up and start to see cases research, to close back down. Texas is number two. Texas is going to open up, and I think they're going to stay open regardless of what happens. Um, you know, I just. There's the governor that said something about, you know, there's things that are more important than life. Yeah, and the lieutenant governor said something effectively, you know, grandparents will give up their lives for the economy, you know, something, something like that. Um, you know, I, I think this, I think it devalues people's lives too, to say, uh, well, it's old people that are getting it, or it's people with uh, comorbidities. And I want to ask those people, you know, if your elderly grandmother was murdered, would you say, well, that's okay, because she was probably going to die within the next year or two anyway. So we don't require justice, because you know, it's just a little shortened, uh, shortened lifespan. So really, there's no harm done. Um, and that's sort of the attitude of people, you know, we, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're killing people, but you know, it was 80 year old person, or it was a 50 year old guy with diabetes, and, and, and that devalues those lives. And I really, I'm, I'm really, you know, opposed to that sort of thinking. Um, my, my wife has an autoimmune disorder, and she has to avoid anything that excites her immune system. Um, her, her body, her immune system will actually attack and destroy her platelets. And so uh, it's called ITP. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful that she doesn't get exposed to things that cause her immune system to uh, start to respond because it can eat her platelets up. And uh, that's happened. You know, she's had a couple of rounds where her platelets crashed almost nothing and she bruises. And so I'm especially sensitive to this whole, whole topic. Um, but, you know, back to the question, am I, am I bearish? I, I'm pretty bearish because I just, you know, it, there was a story this morning that I saw uh, people sharing, and it was about a nail salon in Oklahoma that opened up. And, you know, they, they said, well, you know, we're happy to open. I think this was on May the 3rd. And, you know, bring your masks or you will try to provide one. And, but it, there was nothing enforced and there's nothing. Um, and then a couple of days later, they sent out a note and said, one of our staff may have been exposed to COVID. And then they sent out another note that said, one of our staff has come down with COVID. If you came in during this time, you need to isolate for 14 days and we're having to close down again. So when you have stories like that, it's gonna make people fearful. It's going to make people not going to restaurants. And why does this happen? Because we're not enforcing uh, common sense measures. We're not, we're not enforcing things that will definitely slow the spread. And, you know, when people say, you know, I'm, I'm free and you don't, I'm, I'm not gonna be made to do anything. I said, okay, but understand you're the same person that's saying we have to open up the economy. And by not agreeing to do these things, you're going to ensure that we can't fully open the economy, get things going. We're gonna open, we're gonna resurge, we're gonna close. 
and and people are going to be fearful. They're going to constantly be fearful, and you know that people will live in fear if they know that you know guy at the grocery store got COVID. You know your your uh, checker got COVID, and you know suddenly maybe maybe you were exposed. It's going to have a real chilling effect on the economy. People are still. I think airlines are going to suffer for a long time, and I think travel is going to be down uh, for for quite a while. You know, we still have travel that's a lot lower than it was, uh, you know, before this started. But we're getting into higher travel season, so that's helped a little bit with the oil prices. We're starting to recover a little bit um, on on miles driven, and so demand is starting to come back a little bit. It's still, you know, maybe thirty percent below where it was a year ago but it's starting to come up some, and I think it'll continue to come up, but it's going to be depressed for a while. And we're not gonna get back to normal uh, for a long time. Now, the question, what if I'm wrong? Okay, how could I be wrong? Well, and I thought this the other day, what if it just, you know, fizzles out? And, and you know, this is, there are certain people that are really susceptible to this and, and uh, you know, it just sort of fizzles out like it did, you know, in North Korea. But North Korea, it didn't just fizzle out there. Um, you know, they took real strong measures. So I watched these- In North Korea or South Korea? I'm sorry, sorry, South Korea. I said North Korea, I meant South Korea. Um, so I don't think it's gonna just fizzle out. I, I entertain that possibility that, okay, maybe there's, maybe the susceptible people are infected and then the people who are not so susceptible, the cases start to decline. And that's maybe one of the best case scenarios, but I think it's really unlikely scenario. And then you say, well, how about a vaccine? Um, that's another really, really good scenario that we got a vaccine and it got tested and it was, uh, you know, it worked well, but, you know, we're a ways out from that. So I'm looking at the fall and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not sure what happens across the summer with, you know, this tug of war between opening up and summer weather kind of slowing the spread. And I think that is universally true. You look at every hot country and, it's growing, but it's growing at a much slower rate than it did in the colder countries. So, because outdoors, the the virus, the yeah, the exactly. droplets People, from your breath kind of exactly. either dry up quickly or the the it, UV that, light, the UV light, the you know, people are just you know, in the summer. Um, I mean, it's the same reason that we have a flu season that goes to fall and winter, and and it peters out in the spring and summer. It's people, you know, you're more likely to be clustered in houses in groups. Uh, um, you know, indoors in the in the uh, winter, and then you are in the summer, and so the the risk in the fall is we start to see a serious resurgence, and because we've already had lockdowns and we've seen that has a devastating impact on the economy, there are going to be a lot of states that fight any you know any reimplementation of lockdowns, and so I see us because we don't implement these common sense measures, we're going to kill a lot of people unnecessarily. We're going to hurt the economy much more than we we should. Um, you know, if, if I could just have one thing, I would say everybody in public has has to wear a mask. Unless you're, I mean, if you're out fishing and and you know you can stay away from people around you, you know, you're in the outdoors. That's one thing. If you're going into a place of business, or you're going exactly, to, you know, I don't. I don't see any possibility we have football stadiums full of people this year. I just don't think that it's possible. Um, I think it's going to be a long time before we can see that sort of gathering. Um, but, you know, if you're in any sort of public gathering um, where you're going to have close proximity to people, I would require, require a mask. And I think that is the uh, cheapest, most common sense measure that we could have in place. And people go, well, masks don't work. You say, well, if you say they're not 100% effective, I would say, yeah, they're not 100% effective, but we need to slow the spread and that will definitely slow the spread. And why is that important? Because that gives people more confidence to be in public and, and go to businesses. And that's what people who demand, you know, number one, open this economy. Number two, you can't make me wear a mask. Those things are going to butt heads. Your refusal to wear a mask means we're not gonna be able to fully open the economy without having the consequences of potentially having to close things back down or keep well, it I, careful and keeping a drag on it. The way I think of uh, freedom as far as you don't, you can't make me wear a mask is, that's right, when you're at home, I can't make you wear a mask. When you're out on your lawn, I can't make you wear a mask. But if you're on 
a road that's a public road that doesn't belong to you. That is not your road. That's owned by the state or the county or the township or the federal government. And you're in a car that you had to be licensed, insured, and now you're going into someone else's place of business that they own. It's, I mean, if it's your business, that's different, right? If you actually own yep. it outright, yep. go ahead, don't wear a mask. But you don't own these places. They don't belong to you. And if, if, if someone can enforce you to wear pants and underwear, right. then there's, there's no difference putting cloth on your legs versus cloth on your face. It's the same exact thing. Well, I, mean, I got into a debate with a guy the other day about seatbelts. And he said, I don't wear my seatbelt because I view the risk as low to me. And he said, and, and, you know, I know it's the law, but I'm exercising my personal freedom and I don't wear a seatbelt. And I said, okay, so does anybody depend on you? Do you have people that love you? So if you go through the windshield because you were exercising your personal freedom and you miscalculated the risk, does it affect anybody else? If you have loved ones that follow your example and they don't wear their seatbelt either and they go through the windshield, does that affect you? Does that affect anybody else? So when you're exercising these personal freedoms and it starts to impact other people, that's not just a personal decision. You're making a decision that affects other people. And you know, I, I, I say that again and again, it, I don't care what people do in their private life until it starts to impact me. When, when, when you start to infringe on my freedom or, or my right to, you know, um, be safe, then that's a different story than you just, you know, exercising your freedom. Well, we're at around 30 minutes. So why don't we wrap up with a okay. summary? So theoretically, potentially, um, there could be a curious person out there who is just an everyday person watching this video and who is not really in tune with energy or economics or the likelihood. And they're thinking, hey, you know, they're gonna, I'm going to be called back to work soon. And, you know, the stores are going to open up. We're going to be back in the restaurants soon enough. And, you know, I've got some buddies. They just need to get their stores open and I'm going to start. What, 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 how do you view things as far as likelihoods? Okay. For, so, for, for like just a regular person that's like, they're not, I mean, they're paying attention to the, the pandemic, but not necessarily the economic side of things. Okay. So, I, and I never really answered your question. Am I, am I bearish? I, I'm, I think there is a very high risk that things get worse from here, that Maybe we have a little period here where it looks like we may be peaking and it looks like, but even remember when we're peaking, that means we got as many deaths on the downside that we had on the upside. So um, there is a lot of risk going forward here. And so what I tell people, you know, I know a guy who works for uh, the postal service and he said that people are spending their uh, pandemic, you know, assistance checks on all kinds of junk, you know, they're buying- Ouches. TV three people in my family bought couches, three people. So, so I would tell people, put that money in the bank because there is a high risk that things get a lot worse. Don't treat that as a windfall. Treat it as something that you will need. We don't know if Congress will agree to, you know, give more money. And you may be in a real bind here with respect to your job. I, I think there is a very small probability that things are substantially normalized by the third quarter. And it's all about, you know, it's not about just what you predict. It's about, you know, it's, it's looking at risk reward. That's what investing is all about. It's looking at risk reward. Is there a possibility that things are normalizing? Yes, but I think, you know, given what I see and, you know, the more information that you can get, the better you can get at making, you know, these risk reward assessments. I just don't see us returning to normal um, anytime soon. And uh, even as things start to open up, that increases the risks. Now, I, I want to be clear, I'm not opposed to places opening up because, you know, there's a big risk to the economy and to people, you know, being, uh, you know, unemployed. But I wish we were enforcing some of these measures that would, 
you know, give people confidence that they can go out and they can go to work and not worry about getting sick because I think this pattern is going to be repeated over and over again. So if you're some, if you're just average person and you're watching the economy start to open back up and you're thinking, you know, you'll be called back to your job, I would say save every penny you can possibly save. Don't make any uh, big discretionary purchases right now because you know, you may be sent back home. Um, I think it depends on where you live. If you're in Texas, I think you're probably not going to be sent back home, but the economy itself, I think, is going to be slow. It's, there's, it's going to be a drag on the economy. So your business may not get back to normal. So there may be a chance that you are laid off. Um, or there's a chance that, you know, if you work in a meatpacking plant and they say everybody back to work, well, you better make sure that you are plenty protected because you know, they're, they're working in close quarters and it's cold and, and uh, you know, there's pretty ideal conditions for spread. And there's been a lot of clusters in these meatpacking plants. So, um, you know, I, people are going to have to protect themselves as much as they can. If you're going in the store, there's a lot of peer pressure if you're in an area that doesn't require masks to not wear a mask. And, and you get people saying, what are you, are you sick? What, what are you, uh, and, and personally, I'm just trying not to go in any place. I mean, that's the way we've handled things. We're, we're picking up groceries curbside. We're wiping them all down when we get home. And people might say, that's really not necessary. And I say, well, there, I've, there's too many cases of people who do not know how they got COVID. They have no idea. And so, yeah, given my situation with my wife and the autoimmune disorder, we're being very, very careful here. We're trying to limit exposure. And I still go out. I'll, I'll go out jogging, and if somebody's coming down the path, I'll cross the I'll cross the street. You know, I will get well away from them. And I would just encourage people to take every measure you can to protect yourselves and your family. And I would encourage governments to you know get serious about you know enforcing some of these measures like you know requiring masks, so that not just you know. For, for, per, for people, you know, to protect them from themselves, but to protect everybody else. I mean, that's the issue. If you can protect everybody else, then the economy can start to get back to normal. So I have an analogy I think I want to share and get your reaction to it. And I also want to just ask, there are a couple people on YouTube right now. If you're on YouTube right now and you have a question that you'd like me to post to Robert, type it in right now this second, because YouTube is delayed by about 10 seconds while I'm asking Robert this next one. And also, uh, if you're watching this anytime, please hit the thumbs up if you appreciate content like this and hit the subscribe and hit the, ring the bell for notifications and put in a comment and um, save it and share it and whatever, you know, cause this is important stuff. We're, we're living in <laughs> uncertain times. So the way I'm thinking of this risk reward thing is that there's a big difference. We're all mostly familiar with driving a car. So you're driving a car and there's a whole range of risk reward when you're driving a car. Right. If I was to go out driving right now, it's a sunny, beautiful day, hardly anybody on the roads. Um, you know, my car is new. I have very little expectation as long as I'm not tired that I'm going to have any difficulties. You know, if I see someone coming towards me, I'm going to go in the ditch or whatever, but I, I'm, I'm going to be all right. This is not the same as I drive my previous car, which happened to break down not so long ago, this past winter, in a blizzard, at nighttime, can only see a couple hundred feet in the front of the car, if that, winding country roads, you know, that's where I feel like we're at right now. And as far as risk reward, uh, it only, it doesn't make sense to be going the speed limit 70 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour on a day like that. Well, right, because I mean, it, the, the analogy is, you know, on your clear sunny day, you can see far in the distance. And right now we can't. I mean, we've got a really hazy picture and, um, you know, nobody knows. They keep raising the death projections over and over. They raise the death projections. We just don't know what's going to happen as these uh, places start to open back up. We've seen places open up and ca cases surge and them have to close back down. And so there's a when there is such a huge variable here, you've got to play it safe. And that's especially, you know, with your, with your life, with your health. If you live with somebody who's elderly, that increases the, 
uh, you know, the risks for you or it increases the potential consequences if you were to get something. So you've got to be more cautious and certain people in certain circumstances have to exercise even more caution. And, you know, if your government's not requiring you to do certain things, you have to maybe take matters into your own hands and do everything you can to protect yourself. And uh, yeah, we got, you know, the, the, just the view ahead is unclear. And I would be the first to say, um, here's, I think it may go a certain way, but it might not. But then you go, what's the downside of being wrong in either case? You know, if things start to get better from here and I'm taking precautions, is that better than me thinking, you know, things are gonna get, gonna get worse or, or if things get worse and I'm not taking precautions, but I thought they were gonna get better? You know, I mean, it's so better. If a clear, so if a clear spot appears in the blizzard and you can suddenly see three, 400 feet ahead, doesn't necessarily make sense to push it up to the speed limit. Right. You know, I, again, you know, back to the seatbelt analogy, I said this to somebody this morning. It's like, I, I put on my seatbelt not expecting to have an accident, but this person is constantly trying to say the numbers are probably overstated. And I said, you know, the analogy of the seatbelt here is, that's like you getting in the car and saying, my risk of an accident is low. I'm not gonna wear my seatbelt. And that's true, your risk of an accident is low. But wearing a seatbelt is a very minimal intrusion that will protect you in the low uh, probability event that you are in an accident. So if, you, if you're arguing to people, you know, you're really not likely to be in a car accident, then you're more likely to cause people not to take those precautions. And there's really no downside to taking those precautions. Well, and something that the, whoever you were chatting with might not recognize is that the uh, seat belts, the airbags in the car are only designed to work properly when the person is belted in place. And if you slam into something without the seat belt on and you run into your steering wheel and the bag inflates, you're gonna die. Yeah. So it's, it's the, the car is not designed for people not wearing seat belts, especially in the driver, the, either the front positions there so and that's kind of the I mean our economy is not designed for people to be able to come into shops who are infectious you know right. without trying to minimize the contagion and keeping a little bit of physical distance and right. I, I think I think the the whole idea of like the uh, salons and the manicurists that you were talking about and masseuses, I mean, anything where you're touching one another, I, I, I'll just let my grow, my hair grow out a while. Yeah. <laughs> and my, and my, my wife, she doesn't mind using the trimmers and she, she makes sure to stop before it's all gone, so. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much, Robert, for being on the line today. And if you have questions, please put them in the comments. And Robert, if people want to uh, chat with you, how, how could they do that? Um, so I'm on Facebook and um, I, funny thing, I started getting a whole bunch of friend requests. I had my Facebook's public and I was letting anybody send me a friend request. I started getting a whole bunch. So I had to restrict that to friends of friends. So it's a little bit harder to add me on Facebook now. Um, but, you know, if they're a friend of yours I and mean, we're friends, they can add me as a friend and we can talk on Facebook. Um, but my Facebook is public. So, I mean, they can go and comment if they're on Facebook, they can go comment on, on my, uh, on my feed, on any of the discussions that we're having. And we discuss COVID a lot these days. Um, you know, and you publish articles as well that are not energy related, right? I, I do uh, some, well, I, so for Forbes, I write energy articles mostly. And for Investing Daily, I write investing articles and I run a, a service there for them called Utility Forecaster where I manage a paper portfolio and we recommend buys and sells and give people personal financial advice. So I write those articles. Uh, I've got a subscription column there and then I've got a free column that's every Tuesday and it's just basic uh, you know, personal finance advice most of the time on you know, what people should do. Talk about the pandemic checks, what should you do with it? talk about the changes in the law to your 401k, should you tap into it? And if you do, here are some of the things to think about, just those, those kinds of things. So, um, and the COVID thing, because it impacts energy, I've been watching this from the very beginning. And I started sounding the warning 
in early February that this could be a devastating pandemic. We don't know yet, but the risk is really high. I mean, I, I actually was at the money show the first week in February, and I said, I'm really, really concerned about COVID that's going on in China right now. And if it gets loose here in the US, that it could be a real big problem. And I'm, I'm not a medical professional, I'm a chemical engineer, but I, I analyze data and I look at data so I can see trends and, and analyze data. But, um, and, and that's why I would say, I think wearing masks is a good thing because I can see the studies. I can see studies and, you know, when somebody says, I don't feel like it protects me, I'll point to a study. And I'll say, well, here's actual study that showed, or here's a country that in, implemented masks and, you know, infections fell dramatically. And they say, well, you know, maybe it was because they did this or that. And I'll point them to studies. You know, I read a lot of scientific literature and I can, you know, interpret that. So, um, yeah, the best place to engage me probably is on, is on Facebook. Uh, but if you just want to read, I, you know, go to Investing Daily, go to Forbes, uh, go to my blog, rrapeer.com. I usually post most of my articles else other places end up there anyway. All right. Thank you so much for your time again, Robert. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you next time.